Hello, everybody. My name is Gilda Ross. I'm the Glen Bard Student and Community Projects Coordinator. It's a beautiful Chicago area night, and we are so, so delighted that you have joined us. We are thrilled beyond words to be once again hosting Dana Suskin, MD, back at the Glen Bard Parent Series. She was with us last uh, when she was discussing her first book, 30 Million Words, and now she's back again um, as she is uh, completing the launch of her newest book, Parent Nation, and it's a special, special treat. All of us are in for a, a wonderful opportunity. I want to thank the sponsors who make GPS possible. We are now virtual, we are weekly, and we are broad in the offerings that we have, which tonight is a good example. Glenbard, as you know, is a high school district, and we have several programs like this one where we highlight that early child. We recognize the importance of that era, exactly what we'll be talking about tonight. Now, upcoming this week, so this week we have two programs. We're going to welcome back Frank Palmasani. Frank is a true expert in financial aid. So if you or if anyone you know around the country you think might find this useful and who wouldn't, please do share it. Um, and, and if you're a social media person, like us on social media and just let everyone know these programs, although they're called the Glenbard Parent Series, they really are for every single one. Um, and then the next week we have Dan Pink who will be joining us on Tuesday night. Dan Pink has written a new book called The Power of Regret, How Looking Backward Moves Us Forward. He will be in conversation with another one of our favorite people, Julie Lifkan Haynes, who is the author of the book, How to Raise an Adult. That should be a great conversation. Um, going into September, uh, on a similar topic, we'll be talking with Anya Kamenitz, NPR reporter, about her brand new book, Stolen Year, How COVID Changed Children's Lives and Where We Go Now on September 7th. And then it's time for our community read. Also, there's a theme here. And our community read is by a book by Jamil Zaki from Stanford, The War for Kindness, Building Empathy in a Fractured World. That's on September 14th. So come back and once again, please do share. Thank you for the trust of your time. We promise you, you come to GPS and you will always have a takeaway and you will always learn one thing and the one thing may become everything. I'm gonna turn the program over now to Janine Woltman. Janine is the uh, coordinator of the Glenbard Early Childhood Collaborative. She has an, an, some couple of announcements. If you have questions, please be thinking about them and enter them in the chat in the Q&A and we will absolutely and happily take those questions later. Janine, take it away. Great, thank you, Gilda. Um, we're really excited this year. This is our first early childhood Glenbard Parent Series that we're actually able to provide Gateways credit. Now, any of you who are child care providers, home visitors, anywhere in those fields, you know, sometimes it's hard to get that. We're really excited for that. So any of you who are interested in getting credit, or if you are maybe not a provider, you're a parent, and you're wanting to get entered in this amazing raffle to win a free book from tonight's presentation, go ahead and fill out just the quick form that's in the chat. Just go ahead and complete that. If you are looking for Gateways credit, we just do ask that you put your number and that you put your email address so we can send you um, just a quick survey at the end. But for sure, go ahead and do that. We're so excited to be able to offer this to everybody. Um, I really want to be sure tonight to thank Dr. Dana Suskin and welcome her to this event. Um, as Gilda said, we had her a few years ago talking about 30 million words, and we were just so excited hearing her present about Parent Nation and getting the opportunity to bring her back to all of you. Um, just a quick introduction, Dr. Dana Suskin is the director of the Pediatric Cochlear Implant Program at the University of Chicago. A recognized award-winning thought leader on the national stage, Dr. Suskin has dedicated her research and clinical life to optimizing foundational brain development and preventing early cognitive disparities and their lifelong impact. Dr. Suskin is the co-author of The Parent Nation, Unlocking Every Child's Potential, and fulfilling society's promise and 30 million words building a child's brain. 
She's a member of the Academy of Pediatrics and a fellow of the Council on Early Childhood. Her work has been profiled by numerous media outlets, including the New York Times, The Economist, Forbes, NPR. We are delighted to welcome her back to the Glenbard Parent Series and just welcome. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much, Janine. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to be back. I am going to first start sharing my screen. Um, it really is an absolute pleasure to be back. It feels like just yesterday that I was here for 30 million words and uh, and yeah, I can't believe that we're we're back again. Um, you know, this is a, a favorite event and Gilda, thank you for your leadership and vision in bringing us here together. Um, Janine, thank you so much. And um, yeah, no, I mean, in some ways, Parent Nation is a continuation of uh, from my first book. They both ask the same question. You know, what what does it look like? What does a situation look like that allows all children to thrive? For 30 million words, it really took the lens of at the individual level, at the individual parent, caregiver, child level. This book, Parent Nation, really zooms out and asks the same question, but instead asks, what does a society look like that truly puts children and their healthy brain development at its center? So I am just thrilled to be here today and you know I, I do want to take a step back um, as as Gilda mentioned or Janine mentioned um, it's important to know that this is not my natural habitat um, believe it or not I like to joke my natural habitat where I was this afternoon this morning is in the operating room um, and that's because my day job is as a pediatric physician and a surgeon I really specialize in giving deaf children cochlear implants and allowing them access to sound, uh, to hearing, and to spoken language. Um, some of you all may have seen those YouTube videos of children hearing from the, for the first time. And trust me, it's even better in person, and it never, ever gets old. Um, but the truth is, the true magic happens afterwards, after the activation. And this is a a picture of one of my favorite patients who actually is a Glenbard uh, student. Um, but you can see what happens after you implant a little nine month old who is, I always say that I became a sur pediatric surgeon so that I could be taller than all of my patients. And fast forward 10 years later, I think I just saw him last week, you can tell uh, little Cole is now taller than myself. Um, but it is it is an absolute honor to be caring for children. Um, and in truth, I always say that your surgery might end, but that doesn't mean your obligation to your patients ends. It, your obligation ends when your patient does well, when they go on to live happy, healthier lives. And for when your patients are children, the key to a happy, healthy life is the brain, healthy brain development. Uh, in true, uh, in medical school, I fell in love with the brain. It's one of the reasons that I became a pediatric surgeon. People often think that hearing is all about the ears, but it's really about the brain. And for me, that became extremely clear early on in my practice when I started seeing dramatically different outcomes amongst my patients after surgery. Some of my patients excelled developmentally, others not at all. Some learned to talk, others did not. The ability to hear, it turned out, didn't always unlock their full capacity to learn and thrive intellectually. It was an incredibly painful difference to observe. And for me, compelled to understand the reasons and the origins for these differences, and importantly, what I could do to best you know, allow all my children to thrive, it began a journey far, far outside of the operating room, really into the world of social sciences. And in this journey, I was first inspired by research that found a stark difference in the amount of language, the actual number of words uh, that children were exposed to early in life. Researchers calculated that by the time a child reached their fourth birthday, there was a difference of roughly 30 million words between those who heard a lot of language and those who heard very little. Uh, that's the or obviously the origins of the, the title of my first book. As I learned, as I learned more, I realized that what I was seeing amongst my deaf patients really just mirrored the population at large. 
that in all children, the differences in early language exposure correlated with differences in later achievement. And some of my patients were getting that essential type of experience with language and others were not. Look, the research that inspired me wasn't perfect, far from it, but it was persuasive enough to pull me, a surgeon, from the operating room. And it gave me, it gave me a critical place to start. I really think of this 30 million word study as just a first sentence in what has become a robust and extensive body of literature, a body of literature that includes cutting edge research that reveals the way in which language input stimulates all parts of a child's brain. Um, and some of you may be familiar with this uh, sort of science of early brain development, but if you'll permit me, I'd like to share a little bit more. Uh, I'd like to share just a few minutes in explaining it for those who don't know it, um, because what the science reveals is truly fascinating and at the same time impossibly simple. I like to say that neuroscience tells us in truth that there are many ways to parent a child, but there's really only one way to nurture that or build that child's brain. And that's through nurturing talk and interaction and protection from toxic stress. And we know this to be true, but the truth is there is an alarming disconnect between what we know that children's brains need and what we've actually done to meet those needs. In many ways, we squander this incredibly, incredible evolutionary gift that we're given, a really short period of window of time in which we can set up a child for success in life by nurturing his or her foundational brain development. As, all of, as many of you all know, who are parents or who have taken care of children, early in life, infants are essentially helpless. They rely entirely on others to meet their needs. And really, humans are unique in that way. Uh, you know, when you think about it, you know, a horse, a zebra, they stand within minutes of being born and walk within two hours. Baby chimpanzees can cling to their mothers as she drumps from tree to tree. And on day one, even the newly hatched sea turtle knows how to find their way to the ocean, um, you know, from the sand. But not our infants. Our infants come into this world absolutely underdone. They're undercooked. So much so that the pediatricians call this first three months of life uh, really the fourth trimester. Babies can't even hold up their heads for weeks and walking and eating on their own takes a good year. It is really phenomenal. But I bet many of you all haven't wondered, why is it that babies come out so helpless um, and need all this time after birth to really grow their brains? The leading explanation for this of apparent developmental delay is that nature had to compromise. You know, when humans, you know, women, became, when we became, began walking upright, the pelvises of females narrowed. At 40, you know, 40 or so weeks of pregnancy produces a baby's head that's really at the upper limit of what a woman can pass through her birth canal. By, <clears throat> by the 40 weeks, but by 40 weeks, the brain still has a lot more growing to do. So unlike the, the previously above animals that I mentioned, whose brains are almost adult sized uh, by the time they're born, babies' brains are only one third the size of an adult size. That's so that they can fit through the, the birth canal. And as anybody who has given birth, uh, and I have done that a few times, I can tell you I did not want my son's large head to be any larger than it was. Um, and to be clear, when the baby's, you know, baby is born, that underdeveloped brain is really waiting for instruction, instructions from the environment of how to wire up, how to finish off the job. And most of this growth will occur during those first two years of life. In fact, some 80 to 85% of the brain is the physical brain occurs during this period of time. But for generations, our focus in terms of public attention and money has really been focused on what? The K-12 space. This means that we've really skipped over the earlier phases that are critical to laying the foundation for learning. Efforts come way too late, even preschool, which is incredibly important, 
comes too late to really capitalize on this evolutionary gift of the first years of life. And why is this? It's because of what we call neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the brain's incredible ability to reorganize itself by forming new neural connections throughout life, but it's at its peak between birth and the age of three. And in truth, the brain circuits are almost a use it or lose it proposition. And while the brain remains plastic throughout their lives, throughout all of our lives, and I want to really emphasize that I don't, this is not a story of it's too late, it's just easier, much easier early on. They will, the plasticity in the early year, the brain will not be as plastic as during the early years, um, and it's almost a magical time period. The development during this time period, as I've alluded to, is just breathtaking. Some one million new neural connections are happening every second. In fact, when we enter this world with the relatively underdeveloped brain and experience this protracted period of foundational brain development, it is the universe's evolutionary gift that allows us humans to be the smartest, most creative and productive of all species. And so you may ask, well, how do, how do we capitalize on this incredible evolutionary gift? Um, neuroscience has really shown us that to capitalize on this, as I mentioned before, babies need most is rich nurturing conversation. This is often called serve and return. It's that back and forth interaction that comes naturally to parents interacting with children. It almost looks throwaway, but it is so powerful. It is powerful enough to help children move forward and develop two critical skills that will allow them to succeed both in school and in life. It delivers first cognitive skills, the kind that are found on intelligence and aptitude tests, reading and writing, numeracy, pattern recognition. Um, and it really, and then the other thing that it helps build that people don't really think about a lot is those soft skills, those non-cognitive skills like grit and resistance, uh, resilience, excuse me. In other words, that nurturing interaction in the early years builds the entire brain. Um, it, I like to think of it as, you know, when you think about milk feeds the body, but nurturing interaction feeds the growing brain. So you may ask, how does that relate to me? So, you know, in 2010, I launched the 30 Million Words Initiative. As I mentioned, I was really inspired by the early work of Hart and Risley. It was the beginning. Um, and it was initially called the 30 Million Words Initiative. I now call it, we've renamed it the TMW Center for Early Learning in Public Health, um, because I think this really reflects what we're talking about, early learning and the importance of a public health approach. My primary goal was to help ensure the healthy development in all children and to give every child the ability to reach his or her potential, both intellectually and emotionally. For us, brain science pointed the way. Everything we designed and did was based on the fact that nurturing interaction between caregiver and infant lays the foundation. It, it has and always will be about the power of parents. My team and I developed evidence-based programs and strategies to help show, show parents the, that the impact of talking to babies and young toddlers those strategies became the theme of TMW. And any of you all who read my first book will remember those three T's. Tune in, talk more, take turns, or what we like to call the three T's. And we demonstrated to parents that rich conversation with these three T's is what is needed to unlock a child's potential. And that parents, as well as other loving caregivers, can <clears throat> hold the key during the early years. I want to really emphasize that all adults, no matter their education, wealth, or work, can master the essential techniques for optimally building a child's brain. These ideas, really a straightforward approach uh, to a very complex problem, was intuitively appealing and a great success. I think, in fact, that many hoped that it would be a silver bullet. But of course, there are no silver bullets in this world. 
but I was proud to share the three T's with many families throughout the TMW Center programs and through my first book, 30 Million Words, Building a Child's Brain. And I wanna emphasize my colleagues and I at the TMW Center conducted numerous, we still do, numerous rigorous studies of our programs. We found that indeed our strategies work and that the science that supports them is solid. The programs we promote can and often do improve the lives of children. But, but, the, but, but as our research programs took us into more and more families' homes and into their lives, in truth, I realized just how much was being asked of parents. Because our studies followed children from their first day of life into kindergarten, my team were getting to know parents up close and over time. The parents' enthusiasm was thrilling. They, they embraced those three T's with gusto, tuning into their children, talking more about whatever they were doing as they went about their daily lives, taking turns, encouraging their children to participate in conversation from day one. They wanted what all parents want, to help get their children off to the best possible start. The problem was those three T's only took parents so far. In truth, real life would intrude again and again and again. There was Randy who loved the fact that talking about his love of baseball could help his son learn math, but yet had to work over two jobs and most days had less than 30 minutes with his kids. There was Sabrina who gave up a well-paying job to care for her husband when he got sick her family ending up in a homeless shelter where she raised two young children, the youngest still a baby, in a stressful and a chaotic environment. There was Michael and Kiana, whose most searing story, who's the most searing of stories, whose life was upended when he was arrested for a crime he did not commit and sat in jail for five years awaiting a trial that quickly exonerated him. Everywhere I looked, I saw hurdles looming in front of mothers and fathers. I realized with both sadness and resolve that our programs can share with parents the knowledge and powerful skills that build their children's brains, but our programs don't substantially change the day to day lives of parents who participate. The larger reality of a family's circumstance the work constraints, economic stressors, bad luck, or just injustice and or injustices they're subject to all matter as much as those three T's for healthy brain development. They either allow for brain building power of talk to occur, or if they limit the opportunities for engaging in the three T's, they stifle it like a weed choking off a garden. Once again, I was struck by the alarming disconnect between what we know that children's brains need and what we have actually done to meet those needs, or, or more accurately, what we've done to help parents meet those needs. In truth, at the very moment when parents and children in this country could use the most support, and when that support would have been outsized influence by strengthening the neural connections, our society largely leaves them on their own. This reality, of course, became painfully apparent as COVID left families reeling, millions forced to scrape by with no backup whatsoever. Parents were left on their own, anxious and exhausted. They were called on to manage every aspect of their patients' lives. Even among those who, who didn't lose their jobs, millions of parents, mostly mothers, ended up quitting or cutting back on work hours. Doing it all was just unsustainable. The pandemic was like a powerful earthquake with lingering aftershocks, and we are still feeling those aftershocks that showed us just how shaky our nation's infrastructure of supports for children and their parents really was and still is. The bottom line is we have made it difficult for parents, all parents, to raise children in a way that optimizes their healthy brain development, and we've made it impossible for some. The fact that we, as many of you all know, in, this, in the United States is the only one of 38 
OECD countries, only one of the developed nations not to mandate paid parental leave is, is shocking. I think many of us intuitively would understand this from a parent's perspective. But recent research from Natalie Brito and her colleagues at NYU shines a light on what it means for kids too. The study indicates that amongst 100 infants, those whose mothers had three months of paid leave experienced more advanced neurologic um, development than those parents who didn't, who had unpaid leave. These policies aren't just a, uh, have impacts on parents and children, because of course the well being of children depends on the support of their parents. We, as a country, we also spend less on early childhood care and education than any other developed nation, with, which results in a fragmented, non consistently high quality system of care. Uh, if anybody wants to take a look at this slide, you can see that the average amount that countries invest. I mean, I'm not talking about the Scandinavian countries that are about 38, uh, 28,000 per year per child, but a, an average of $14,000 per year per child is spent with all nations included. But you can see at the very bottom where the US comes in, a whopping $500 per child. It's quite shocking. And those of, and approximately half, and what has this resulted in? Not only do we have a fragmented early childcare system, but almost half of Americans live in so-called childcare deserts. I mean, you just have to open up the newspaper to see the, the fact that there is almost no access. And in truth, only 10% of existing programs are designated with developmental science in mind while the rest, 92%, are of varying degrees. And remember, this is the time period when the evolutionary gift has been given to us that we can build children's brains in the strongest way possible. Given all of this, it's not exactly surprising that the US differs uh, from other countries in another important measure, parental happiness. We don't often talk about it because the truth is, is that this is not about parents loving their children. All parents love their children, want the best for their children. But this is about parents' happiness. And in truth, in most industrialized societies, parents in general report lower levels of happiness than non-parents. Raising children is hard. But a, 20, a study of 22 developed nations led by Jennifer Glass and her colleagues found that the gap is largest, guess where? in the United States, and that in truth, countries with more generous family friendly policies, paid time off, childcare subsidies, and the like, are associated with smaller disparities in happiness between parents and non parents. Put it simply, parents in this country lack support, they lack choices. No matter their political affiliation or religious orientation, employment or educational status, too many parents seem to be struggling. And in truth, the realization motivated me to write this latest book, which is my last book. And I look, I, tr I knew that the world didn't need another how to book about what parents can do, though my publisher would have loved it. Instead, I thought perhaps a book that shows us how that same brain science can inform a society that works for parents and caregivers, not against them, that could help shift the narrative and make the case for a society that truly puts children and families at the center. I named this book Parent Nation, but I should be clear that when I say parent, I'm really, really speaking to any loving caregiver caring for a child. Because as I was, and as I was writing, I spoke to dozens of parents from all walks of life, and I was struck time and time again about how much they shared in common. Even parents who on the surface seemed like they had nothing in common told me stories and shared thoughts, concerns, and fears that were incredibly similar to one another. Even though their circumstances differed wildly, the fact that they were struggling to parent in the way they wanted to, in the way that they knew best for their children, that was a universal. I listened to one mother, Jade, who is deeply religious and believes that a mother's place is in the home as she explained through tears that the lack of health insurance and an inadequate family income sent her back to work at Starbucks after her kids were born 
in spite of her dream of being a stay-at-home mom. And I got to know Talia, who, who at the University of Chicago, who had two babies while earning a PhD in psychology, but gave up a promising postdoctoral position when it became untenable to manage the demand of the job and two children under four. The economics of paying for childcare no longer seemed to make sense. And in Talia's words, she felt like she was failing in all parts of her life. Unlike Jade, she hoped that she work, could work outside the home, but could not. We talk a whole lot about parental choice in this country. It's considered sacrosanct, as it should be. But what does choice mean when there are no options to be had? Jade didn't feel like she had a choice. Talia didn't feel like she had a choice. And neither do millions of parents across the country. I suspect that many of you all hear similar stories from the families in your community. Families who want to give their children the strongest, best possible start. Families who are playing by the rules, who are willing to sacrifice anything for, our, for their children, and yet in many cases are still struggling. And the tra tragic consequence is that this means that their children are not being given every chance to reach their full potential to maximize that evolutionary gift of foundational brain development that occurs early in life. Too often, we see, fail to see the connection between parents' circumstances and struggles and the impact on their young children and their developing brains. But as I said, I am here to tell you that the potential of children depends on the support of their parents. So what does this mean? What can those of us in the room do to ensure that parents receive the supports they need to allow their children to thrive? Fortunately, neuroscience gives us a roadmap. It tells us what to prioritize individually as parents. It shows us how to go forward as a society as well. We can apply what we know about foundational brain development to inform a new way of approaching early childhood in policy and in practice. Look, it's pretty simple what children need. They need enrichment in the form of nurturing, talk, and interaction. And parents need enrichment in the form of education if child, early child development and support and tools to help them put that knowledge into use. Because the reality is that loving young children doesn't mean that you're automatically imbued with the knowledge of early brain development. It means that we should not just invest in parental education. It means that we should provide parents with the time to nurture their, their, their children's brain development, that they should, should have a living wage. And parents need protection from toxic stress that can impede healthy brain development. Um, and just as children need protection from toxic stress, parents need protection from the social and economic forces that impede the ability to, to nurture their children. Any number of public policies can afford, uh, uh, afford the, this type of protection. And I encourage you all to think about what would be most helpful in your communities, uh, whether it be businesses supporting paid leave or communities uh, providing uh, high quality child care. With the neuroscience of early childhood as a guide, the map for our society is clearly marked. Of course, it's critical to emphasize that parents remain the captains of their family ships, manning the helm, but every captain needs a crew to help ensure a safe vo voyage. I always like to say, just as uh, you know, when I go into the operating room, nobody would expect me as a surgeon to go in without my own, my nurse anesthetist or my circulating nurses or anesthesiologist. In that same way, parents deserve their deserve the support to be able to put into action what every parent wants to do to raise their children in the way they see fit. Um, so the truth is, is that the economic and the scientific case is so strong. And in fact, we've known it for some time. Uh, we have known that in the end of the day, those early years are critical for building healthy brain development. So you ask, why, 
why haven't we moved the needle? Anyone who is watching, you know, reading the newspaper today can see, you know, that that families are struggling, but yet our policies don't seem to be to be moving forward. Some wonderful policies are moving forward, but certainly not for children and families. So, so I looked for a bright spot to help think, how can we move forward? Despite having all this information, how can we move our society forward that truly puts parents and families at the center? And in truth, we need to look no further than our nation's own recent past to see how a group of formerly isolated individuals can band together to achieve important and lasting change. In the mid 20th century, Americans over 65 of age were the poorest, most underserved segment of the population. And let, I'm not sure if you all know this, but today, the poorest segment of our population are children and children under five uh, are the poorest of those of those children. Exactly. But in, in the earliest 20th century, it was the elderly. Uh, the elderly faced crippling health care costs and housing costs. According to a government study at that time, 50% of the elderly existed below the minimum standards of decency. And the AARP changed all of that. Thanks to the AARP's effort over the last 50 years, there are now there is now no age demographic better served by society than the elderly and justifiably right they have given so much to our our nation the poverty rates amongst the elderly 65 and over has dropped 70 percent since since uh the 1950s and 60s and the aarp continues to make advances in health care and prescription drug costs and in fact the recent bill uh, at the federal level included uh, a prescription drug plan for for the elderly and they unite constituents across socioeconomic political racial and ethnic divide focusing on the rights and benefits that benefit all of them and their success is legendary but just as our nation's seniors were in desperate need and entirely deserving of support decades ago, so too are parents of young children today. They need more, they should demand more. But the real question is, how do we move forward? As important as what we fight for is how we go about fighting as a united front of parents and allies working together who recognize themselves and one another and who refuse the very notion, I'm sorry about the background noise, um, who refuse the very notion that a child can be someone else's, which is why my team and I have launched a major coordinated campaign with a book release that helps spread the word to help bring, bring them to life. Uh, it's my hope that the Building a Parent Nation campaign will help shift the public will in favor of championing families and giving all children the opportunity to thrive. Um, and really, it's a three pronged approach um, that's called Building a Parent Nation. And, um, and, and if anybody is interested, please view, uh, go on to the website, parentnation.org. Uh, it includes both a ground game uh, as well as book club. Everything is free and downloadable uh, to help bring together parents and providers or anyone who, who, who wants to make this society uh, more conducive and supportive of children and families. And, um, with that being said, I am just, I'm just, because I know I'm getting uh, close to the end of time, I wanted to share just a little uh, creative that uh, we put together. We have a number of creatives on the website uh, that we have used in the social media campaign. And this video uh, includes a video uh, with DJ Pryor, the comedian. Many people might remember his video, uh, which went viral. Uh, he's a partner in this campaign, and we adapted uh, his video uh, as part of the campaign. So I will just share a little bit of this. Did you understand it though? No. No. What our nation has? Lots of devoted parents. What our nation needs? Better ways to support them. Like paid leave for the early days that go too fast. 
The potential of children depends on support of their parents. It takes a nation, a parent nation. So there, um, there, there are many resources on the Parent Nation website, um, and I am just so incredibly thankful uh, to have been able to speak to you all because I truly believe that a Parent Nation is what we need. If all children of all races and ethnicities are to flourish and grow up to participate equally in the economy and civic life of this nation, um, as well as all genders being able to participate equally, um, our society needs to attend and to allow for the healthy brain development of all children. Um, and in that way, I am just so thankful to have spoken to you tonight and would love to, to open up the floor for questions. Dana, you always inspire us with your science send and your words and you make us laugh at the same time. So thank you. First question comes from a student. So uh, if you'll uh, ask your question now, we're ready for you. Alrighty, first of all, I would like to say thank you for your time tonight. Um, first of all, uh, my name is Ronan Bachner. I am a student liaison. <laughs> I would have put your picture up there. <laughs> yeah. um, I have known Dr. Suskin my entire life, pretty much. I have had cochlear implants since I was one, and uh, I've had them for 16 years. Uh, my question for you is um, there are some students probably listening that uh, someday these students will be future parents, including myself. Uh, what advice would you give to us future parents about the importance of building vocabulary in younger children? First of all, Ronan, I, I, I am almost, I am speechless. I am speechless. I, I actually, you're bringing tears. Uh, to my eyes. And for anyone who who read my first book, even though I had to change Ronan's uh, to a pseudonym, he is the 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 one of the important stories of the book. I you are uh, I have tears in my eyes. I'm um, anyway. So yeah, you've taken away my vocabulary. But yeah, no, I think that it is, you know, what Ronan, what you taught me, right, taking care of you so long ago, is that access to sound with a cochlear implant is only the first step, really, that children, you know, need to be um, exposed to rich vocabulary early on. And I know your mother, and I know your mother well, and your dad too, and I know that they, they exposed you to the richest vocabulary, which is why you are just a incredible rock star. Um, you, I've got to connect you with Cole. Um, and so, and, and what's really important is that, you know, we often, th you know, when you think about it, we're talking about building a brain, which can feel overwhelming and we weighty. But then when you realize that just through this nurturing talk and interaction, that you're building a brain, it is, it is quite incredible. And you know, I, I'm serious, Ronan, you taught me so much. Um, and I am on this journey because I saw what it what happens when a child gets that rich language environment and every child deserves that good early start. So and you got You better text me separately. So mm -hmm. I will. <laughs> okay, now we're all crying the ugly cry. Okay, thank you so much, both of you. So Building off of that question, can you spend another minute talking about demonstrating more specifically about that volleying for that younger parent, younger child who who are teenagers who will be parents, like Ronan just said? Yeah, no, absolutely. So you know the the incredible. So the three T's. I'm going to explain it through the three T's. Um, the serve and return that you're talking about is really just you know 
the three T's are tune in, talk more, take turns. The tuning in is a critical part of building a child's brain. It's following that child lead, seeing, you know, what the baby or toddler or, you know, or three-year-old is interested in, following that lead, and then talking about it, using rich vocabulary. And there, you know, the science is, is quite incredible that if you talk about not just the present or the future, but even the past and using rich vocabulary that that even expands your vocabulary more. But I think the most important part of those three T's is take turns, having a conversation from day one. So Ronan and other parents, when they become parents will think, well, you know, this little baby can't have a conversation with me. They're, you know, they're children. They, they don't even have words. But the truth is from day one, babies are can communicate, they communicate with their eyes, with gestures, and it's really on the parents and the providers to respond to it and try to keep that volleying going, going back and forth. And the longer you can keep it going, the better. So, so those three- There's a question about rich vocabulary. What do you mean by that? So it really, you know, it depends on the age of the child, but, um, you know, as I mentioned, it's, it's called decontextualized language. Um, and, you know, if you talk about the, the, again, it really depends on the age of the child, but if you talk about the past, that's really powerful. If you use, you know, as kids get older, you know, you know, go from 10 cent words to 25 cent words, you know, more complex language that helps uh, push forward uh, the word. And it's important to know that it's not that you can build more than just vocabulary with your language. You can build math and spatial ability. So many parents don't realize that from day one, you can use what we call math talk to build vocabulary and math. So even shapes and sizes and comparisons, that counts as math talk. So really, you I, I wasn't joking, you build the entire brain through this serve and return, these three T's. Mm -hmm. You talk about the importance of the stress-free environment to build this resilience. So we know in Parent Nation, we're, we're, as you said, we're moving to global, more community, but how can I, in my own home, how can I maybe control my own stress so that it can more create work for a stress-free environment for my child? Yeah, well, so I, before I, I want to make clear that when, you, when we say stress-free, I mean, like, life is full of stress. I'm talking about toxic stress, sort of the unremitting stress that comes with uh, issues of, you know, homelessness or mass incarceration or even internal stress, you know, parents who are dealing with their own mental health issues or the stressors from work. I mean, Everybody, you know, children are going to be exposed to stress. Parents are going to be exposed to stress unless you're born into a bubble. So, look, I want to be, parents need to give themselves a little grace and not, you know, not stress out about not giving stress. Um, but really this, yeah, this, this, this um, toxic stress is the stuff that I'm talking about that, you know, results from societal structures that force parents to work, you know, three jobs without, you know, being able to provide a living wage or in, you know, violent neighborhoods where, you know, parents just want to get their children to school safely or, you know, with who are struggling with mental health issues, but have, you know, no access to mental health resources. That's the kind of stress. I mean, and remember the you know, my my children dealt with, you know, there's something dealt with a significant stress. They lost their father. This doesn't mean that you are, you know, confined to a life that's going to be, you know, negatively affected. You need buffers. And that's really where parents come in. Uh, the loving support of an individual parent can really help buffer, you know, the ups and downs that every, every child deals with in life. So two things you just mentioned, you talked about the self-compassion for, for ourselves, how, how critical that is. I think about some of the speakers we've had and we'll have like Madis, Madeline Levine, take care of yourself, stress parents, have stressed children and so on. So, and you just mentioned about your own situation. Would you tell us a little bit about that situation and how it might've informed your work? 
Yes, absolutely. And I, I, before I jump in, I really want to respond to what you just said, because I can't emphasize, there are a couple of things that I want to emphasize to any parents. Uh, one, you know, in this, I'm speaking as a mother whose children are, you know, off to college and in the workforce, um, almost, uh, that there is something called good enough parenting. There really, really is. There are no perfect parents. And if they are, then, you know, they're, they're, they're not, they're, you know, it's an avatar. Um, and the truth is, is that, you know, they're gonna, it's, it's the overall trend. You can't look at every data point. We're all going to, we, we, you do have to give yourself grace. And what happens in this country is that because of this American individualism that has convinced parents that this, you know, parenting is a go it alone sort of scenario, we've internalized this. And when things don't go right, we're like, oh my gosh, I am such, you know, I'm a failure. We have, you know, especially mothers, we feel shame and we sort of go inward when, I think that not only do we have to understand that there is good enough parenting, but also some of the decisions that we think we make are really issues of a society that doesn't have structures that allow us to make choices. And, you know, we have to in, I think that's an important realization because to take our country forward to the country that I know it can be, that really puts children and families at the center, we have to be able to say, yes, there is a disconnect that I can be the parent, but to be able to parent the way I need to parent, I need societal and community structures that really support me. Um, that was a long way to go into, you know, did my own life circumstance impact how I view all of this? 1000%. You know, I look, I'm a research scientist, I'm a physician, I through, see it through the lens of the neuroscience, the healthy brain development, but I see as a parent, you know, having lost, you know, my husband in a tragic way, seeing my children deal with, you know, deal with the loss of their father and wondering, gosh, am I going to be able to allow them to have the life that they were supposed to have and the truth is is that my children are okay because i was suddenly surrounded by a community and sort of this invisible support that all parents have that too many parents don't have so i am here today because probably even people in your audience were part of those who really you know wrapped uh, my myself and my family in that support to get us over the rough patches and that's really what societal supports, that's what um, social safety nets strangely are. We don't think about them that way. Uh, Jenna, Jessica Calerco, a sociologist say that other societies have safety nets, we have women, but the truth is we need societal sef safety nets to help sort of even out the fact that all none of us get through life without difficulty and we need to come together to support us all, so. True. That brings us to the a question here. Uh, thinking of providers working with young children, what's one thing you suggest they can do to positively impact our parent nation? Oh, uh, so you uh, are you talking about child care providers? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so look, you are. Uh -huh. I would say the same thing that I am saying to parents of young children you are the guardians of our country's future. We should be saying to you, what can we do to better support you? Because up until now, uh, we have not, and we still haven't, I mean, this is what we need to fight for. We have not given the support and the honor um, the child care providers should be getting. Um, they, you know, our child care system is really you know on the verge of implosion if it hasn't been and child care providers should be paid you know they are the brain builders they should be paid up there with you know at least k-12 teachers or maybe even neurosurgeons <laughs> um and but yes i want you to give yourself grace and i want you to be part of the drumbeat and the voices that need to come together to push forward change in this country here's a question from brooke in, a community, in communities where most members are blessed to be exposed to academics and families that load them with vocabulary and conversation, how can the parents in those communities help other parents who are not in similar environments edify themselves and make their environments richer for their ch children's development? 
Yeah, no, I love that. And, you know, we, we have, you know, part of privilege is lazing all boats. My first answer is going to be surprising. I want you to look to the left, to the right in your community and outside communities and seeing other parents through a collective identity. Because the truth is, is that all parents want the same, you know, almost all parents, there are obviously always exceptions. Want the, I have spent, you know, 20 plus years as a physician. And I, you know, I can tell you that all parents at the end of the day want what's best for their children and will go to the ends of the earth. So seeing all parents in that way, is, I think is a critical part of it. Um, and not in an other, and it shouldn't be othering because that is only, that is one of the important ways that we're gonna be able to come together to push forward change, to see ourselves as a collective whole and a collective identity. It's just that certain parents have been given impossible barriers. With that being said, I think that fighting for the changes that are necessary, you know, obviously, re, you know, resources enrichment, you know, all the ways that, you know, all families could use and sharing, you know, resources with other communities, I think is a really important uh, step, but also pushing forward the policies that will really change, allow the structural changes so that all parents can do what they want to do. So good. The next question, how about when stressed out singing silly rhyming, silly talk rhythms? How about that? I, lo I love that. That sounds great to me. <laughs> Listen, singing and music are an accelerant for healthy brain development, unless you've got my voice. I, you know, I probably with my voice would uh, make children lose vocabulary. But yes, no, singing and rhyming and use, you know, is a powerful way to build a child's brain. So. So after COVID, after your life experiences, what keeps you positive, Dana? Oh, you know what? Meeting and talking to family. Well, two things. One is, you know, the AARP really is a really hopeful bright spot. And I know it's going to take time to happen, but I truly believe that parents um, can come together. And, you know, so knowing that change can truly come, because I think we get stuck when we think that we are stuck. And let's face it, at this moment, you know, for children and families, it does feel a little bit like, why aren't we moving forward, right? I mean, COVID was supposed to be the reset, and things aren't moving forward. I think if anything, it has reaffirmed that a parent AARP is critical, because that is a bright spot. So knowing that change can come and then talking to parents, right? And seeing the children and seeing the young people. I have, you know, I have young kids. I mean, not young kids. I have young adults. And, you know, I think that they are the hope that will move things forward. So it's always such a pleasure. You are, you know, when we have an MD on board, you know, we think science, but then we have the social scientist in you. So we know that we're going to check so many boxes when you come. And I love it. Thank you so much. It is an absolute pleasure. So we love hosting you. We're going to ask people to stick around for another minute because we've got a little film to show them about um, the Glenbart Early Childhood Collaborative. You would appreciate this. Um, you started your day in making a difference in someone's life on the operating table and you finish your day in, your ch in a chair in the office, making a difference in the lives of the people who had the pleasure and the honor of listening to you. We love hosting you. Please come back, whether you write another book or not, all right? <laughs> I will, I will. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Neat, back to you. Absolutely. Thanks, Dana. Thank you. And I was actually really struck that um, one of the things Dr. Suskin mentioned was that brain science, you can use brain science to inform a society that truly puts parents front and center. And we actually just get down with community partners and families to really relook at our vision and it was eerily similar because it's working together as a community to create a society that empowers young children and their families. I love it. Isn't that great? 
Oh, and please go on the website. There's so much you can download. Call me back, honestly. Yeah, yeah, Every, absolutely. I love that. Absolutely. Yay. So and we're looking forward to hosting some some parent villages soon. And so we're really Beautiful. thank yeah. you. All That's right. Thank awesome. you. Bye. And then Dana is Gina, but just want, I just want to make mention, because uh, I forgot to mention this before, um, this brochure is available online and you can ask us to send you a hard copy or card copies. And Janine could tell you, we've been working hard to bring you three programs this year. This is the first in the series. Next is Stephanie Carlson in November. She'll be talking about executive functioning skills. We're finishing up that series with Iona Iruka talking about the importance of belonging for all children. Um, and okay, I'm done with the with the uh, with the PR for upcoming early childhood programs. Janine, back to you. Absolutely. Well, we appreciate all of it, Gilda. No, kind of just to wrap up this evening of just a really great presentation, we really wanted to share a little bit of what's happening right here in our community, um, a way that's really supporting families of our youngest learners. And it's one of our many local home visiting programs. It's called Glenbard Parents as Teachers. And it's just a really short little video, but I hope you stay on to watch to just really get a feel for the impact that just participating in a free program like this can have on families and something that's available in our community. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop that on. And we should all know about it. So thanks for sharing it. You've really helped them to recognize their emotions and how to, you, you teach them so well how to express themselves properly even if they make a mistake the first time, that's okay, because they're little, you know, they, they're not gonna get it right every time, but you continually teach them how to um, say things in a better way or how to express themselves. That's pretty impressive for a two-year-old. Wow. <laughs> Oh. Y este le ponemos juguetes mientras le traemos la y empieza. Ya agarró a agarrarlos y los tira. Mira. Y, y a veces como que se <risa> está. ¿Tú Jaden quieres este? Sí. Por favor. Pasa. Ok, te voy a servir a ti. Gracias. Ok. ¿Puedes servirle al señor elefante? Janine, thanks for sharing that with us. It's a lovely way to close out the program. Absolutely. Thank you for letting us and feel free to reach out to us if you ever have questions about programs. There's a lot we have for young families in our community and we need to grasp onto that. Parent Nation. <laughs> Ronan, thank you so much for joining us tonight too. You brought a tear to our eye. Thank you everybody. We're going to say goodnight and we're going to go hug the children. Thank you so much.